we're all in our everyday chairs, basically. And what I used to do, <laughs> imagine this. Okay, you got your brakes on your everyday chair. I would have somebody take out an Allen wrench and just turn my brakes underneath the chair. Yeah. Then I would take wheels that I had um, taken um, surgical tubing and wrapped it around the push rooms all the way so I had grip. I was playing without gloves. You talking about like that strength. that like orange colored tubing? Yes, exactly. Surgical tubing. And so I'd wrap my wheels. I wish I had pictures of that. It's a crack up. And then we kind of realized, oh, you know, these things turn better if you have some camber. So then I got another whole chair just to use for rugby. Mm-hmm. Another everyday chair. I put washers in the in the uh, in the plates so that I could get enough camber. It probably had like I don't know eight degrees maybe. And so you know I'm still sitting. Which is a, down. which is a lot for an everyday chair. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's the point. I had to have a second chair because it wouldn't go through the doorways anymore. Yeah. It in the bathrooms. So, um, so I ended up uh, using that for another year. And um, things were starting to catch on. Now, at this point, 1990, there's 42 t- teams in the country. So wow, maybe, maybe it grew that third. quick. So it just grew exponentially. But you know what? And, um, it was probably a good blessing that you know you didn't have any, like, specialized equipment and that you were just able to kind of convert your everyday chair into something that just would work for the time yeah, being. Sure. For sure. Yeah. And so my first team was the uh, Berkeley Quadzillas and um, we, um, we were around from 88 till 96. Um, and we climbed all the way to the top. We won nationals once we were in the finals. So four, four years in a row. Lost once to Minnesota, the team I was telling you about, mm-hmm. and two other times to Tampa. You know, Joe Soros and Goldie and Terry Vinderd was the coach, and um, they were they were good, really good. Yeah. And, but so were we. It's often it was them and us, and then everybody else was a step below. So I know and, I uh, know Tampa's been around for the longest time. Are any of those teams uh, from from when you started playing? Are are any of them still around? Yeah, um, he's still around. Let me think about this. Because, like, isn't C- Connecticut's a pretty old school team, right? Yeah, the Jammers. Yeah, they're around. Um, not really, man. Most of them from back in those days, they're gone. They're all gone. I mean, they might be different teams from the same city. Yeah, but they're different, different sponsors, different, different franchise, different, personnel. different franchise. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so. So, as you can imagine, you know, let, let's talk just a bit about Canada, USA, um, before I get into classifications and chairs. So, Canada used to just whoop the you-know-what out of every USA team. They were better. They knew more about the game. They, you know, it started there in 77. And they took great pride in kicking our asses every time they could. And, and I mean, no mercy. Just if we can throw a 50 spot on you, and that means nobody was even pressing yet. I mean, and there's no shot clock. If they could throw a 50 spot on us, they would. And so there was one team in particular that was, I think, unbeaten. I want to say for five years, they were unbeaten. Wow. And that was Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, and, you said? And we're talking, what's that? You said Saskatchewan? Saskatchewan, yeah. I think they called themselves the... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. Well, they had to have been the Sasquatches. Yeah, but they had another name, too. Anyway, they, had, they ran a four-deuce lineup. Well, when the classification system changed, those four deuces, two of them were actually 3.5. <laughs> All right? So you do the math. So anyway... The other two actually were deuces, and they used to whoop us. They used to whoop us good. So what's that, 11, 11 points? <laughs> what's that? That's 11 points. They were running three over. Yeah, exactly. And so um, as we got better, um, we actually had a chance to take them down at the Andy Beck tournament in Dallas 
they were down there, you know, and they were they were pretty arrogant, but they were they were very good. They were the deal. They were the team to beat. And um, I remember uh, we had tied the game with like 40 seconds to go, and we were just going to run the clock. And uh, they weren't pressing us. They they had faith in their half court. De- no, they were pressing us. They came out. They came out to press us when they realized we were just going to run the clock down. And I'm not going to name names here, but somebody made an inadvisable pass behind his back. Ooh. And it went out of bounds. And suddenly they had the ball and the game was tied. Ah. And they, they won the game in the last second. And we lost. And it was, it was it was like, that to me, that was bigger than winning or losing nationals. Losing to that team in that time, that would have been epic. That would have been like, beating the Patriots when they were 18 and 0 in the Super Bowl. That's how big it was. Yeah. It didn't happen. Those uh you yeah. always remember those losses. It doesn't, oh, ma- yeah. it doesn't matter how many it doesn't matter how many years. You always remember those those losses now, that you're just like you had it in the bag and it Absolutely. You know, Tim, I haven't told that story in years and I'm all fired up right now. It's like damn. <laughs> <laughs> If you guys, uh, if you guys did a reunion and ran it back, who do you think would win? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So okay, so I'd say the biggest change, though, two changes were the classification system and chairs. When, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a little credit here. The first picker ever was invented simply to protect my feet from getting hammered. Yeah, um, and that's I, like because you're like a size like 14 or something, right? I have a 14 too. Yeah, six foot. Well, probably five eleven now, but I have a big foot. So anyway, I was I told you like my first practice, my I basically lost my big toenail, mm-hmm. and never grew back properly. But ever since then, I you know my dad was an engineer, and I came home and he had he's a welder, he had everything, and so I said, Dad, I need something to protect protect my feet. He came up with this. You know how everyday chairs have the little, the round little foot holder and your feet stick out? It's got two bars and your feet basically lay across them. Yep. So we took another one of those and welded it to the front of the existing one on my chair. Oh, okay. So it looked like a football face mask. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like an old school, like just the one, the, the face mask with the one bar running across the mouth. Well, it, was, it was two bars, two bars, because we had, a, you know, it was vertical going that direction to protect my feet. Yeah, so yeah. vertical up and down where my feet laid on it and horizontal across the front. And that oh. was, dude, that was it. It, it. it worked. It protected my feet. But the next thing I found out about was if I could get that thing in front of a guy's caster wheel or in front of his um, rear wheel, I could hold them for a split second. Yeah. And it couldn't go anywhere. And that's how the picker was born. And then came the wings. The wings. Oh, and also, before that, like, like raised spoke guards. We didn't have those either yet. We were using old basketball spoke guards that just protected the spokes. But they weren't um, flush against your push rim, so people could still get in there. Mm-hmm. Well, Al Seals and Nils Jorgensen basically took a garbage can lid and zip tied it to their spokes and that's how that was born oh wow so so the first metal spoke guard was actually just a trash can lid yep a trash can lid that we uh made sure had enough width to fit right inside of your push rim and then we also were attached to the push rooms right up flush against the wheel that's how that was born now i don't know I don't know who invented the wings, but they came shortly after that. Yeah. And then it and then it just became like an arms race, right? Of just I like it was every year. And let's give credit where credit's due. So Chris Peterson at top end, he saw what I was doing with my with my front end and he goes, Can I can I work with you on that? And I was, Yes, absolutely. And I and I said, Do I get royalties? 
And he goes, no, because nobody, you know, they just changed one little thing mm-hmm. and you can't really like copyright that. I was like, okay, I get it. I what? Copyright, but a uh, patent. So anyway. What, uh, what were, what were some, what were some of the, wait, hold, hold, what were some of the craziest things that you would see people showing up and uh-huh. just trying out? All right. Well, I was going to give some credit here first. Um, Peterson and uh, Bear Ewing at Eagle, and um, a little bit later, Mike Box, and um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some people here, but they were all involved in this, quote, arms race. Um, also, the shadow uh, quickie people, and it was basically top end and quickie at the, at the beginning, and, and uh, an eagle, and then after that, um, Melrose, of course, came along, and then, of course, Oh, Jeff I didn't know. I along. didn't know Melrose was that old. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, and by the way, Chris Peterson called the first um, picker that he built for me. He called it the Cook Hook, and okay. it was around for about two, three years. And then everybody, everybody just you know went from there and, and took over. Okay, the craziest thing I've seen, and it was it was lethal, was the front end was pointed like a missile. <laughs> and it had two caster wheels that basically looked like roller skates, and they were like maybe about two or three inches apart. And that was Eagle. Barry Ewing did that. Yeah. And I believe I'm going to get called out on this one. I believe Sean Merritt's team, I want to say Norm Leidick had one. And a few, oh, Bill Renji had one and a few others um, when they were up at University of Illinois. And that lasted about two tournaments. Everybody said, no, no, no. <laughs> that is so, that's not cool. Um, you take that, front end, take that front end and just stick it in between the big wheel and the caster, and nobody was going anywhere. Yeah. Who, um, like, so was it just a, was it a, a like a committee of players that would – decide what was allowed and what wasn't allowed or like what kind of organization uh, was there at this point? You know, it was the AGM and they had a a competition committee of sorts. And, um, but I'll say this from about 89 to 94, it was a free for all. Everybody was doing everything. It was like, you know, that was, it was, it was was like, it was like world war one. It was like chemical warfare and, and yeah. anything goes. Well, I was gonna say, yes, I was going to say it's like craft beer. Everybody had to have their own. Okay. And but anyway, it was it was interesting. Here's the bad news: if you didn't have any money or a sponsor, every year you had to get something new, and it was tough for people. And finally, they just came up with the rules that we pretty much have had for the last maybe twenty years. 